And today we're very pleased to have uh, Professor Tomohiro from Tokyo Tech uh, speak to us about integral probability, special functions, and combinatorics, which is the topic of an upcoming matrix uh, program. Uh, Professor Tomohiro uh, Sasamato is one of the leaders uh, in KPZ universality classes and stochastic processes and exact solutions. And uh, I look forward to his talk. Um, we usually do the questions of the talks by the Q&A function of Zoom at the bottom of your screen. If you type in your question um, during the talk or after the talk, uh, we can allow you into the session um, so that you can ask the question in person. So please type in your talk and then we'll allow you to, uh, to speak up. Okay, without further ado, I'd like to um, hand over to Tomohiro. Okay. So let me first uh, share the screen. I don't know. Okay. okay. I think uh, you can um, you can see my screen. Yes, it's all good. Okay, 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 thank you. Okay, so then let's start. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer of this uh, online seminar, right? <clears throat> uh, hosted by Matrix, and especially Yang for giving me this opportunity to give a talk here. Today I'm going to talk with this title, Integrable Probability, Special Functions and Combinatorics. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> uh, I, yeah, I was, kind of asked to give a rather general uh, talk on the, on this kind of uh, stuff. But uh, yeah, in the end, I, my talk will be mostly on the recent uh, works of myself with uh, Takashi Mamura and Matteo Muchikoni. Uh, sorry, my collaborators, um, where is that? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, where is the no? Right here. Yeah, my collaborators. <clears throat> but uh, at least at the beginning, I will try to give further gen general introduction to the subject. Yeah, <clears throat> as Ayan mentioned, uh, there will be a matrix program if uh, with with this kind of subject. But in fact, uh, so this is a kind of first trial of the tandem workshop between matrix and the limits in Japan. But unfortunately, uh, I don't know, so, but uh, this scheme is meant for kind of restricted people. So maybe some people who got, who may be interested just now, uh, they may not be able to attend, but uh, we're hoping to have more, you know, larger size of, larger, larger scale of uh, workshops and so on in the coming years hopefully. So then maybe, yeah, we'll be most welcome to join. Okay, so let's start. Yeah. So, so there are already, my talk will be based on mainly on these two papers with these, uh, my collaborators, Takashi Mamura from Chiba University and Matteo Muchikoni, who was my former student and who is now a postdoc at the University of Warwick in UK. So, yeah. So by using several slides, let me try to introduce this subject itself. So, but uh, let me start from introducing one of the most well-studied and basic uh, kind of model in this community. So this is the ASAP. So this is just an abbreviation. Yeah, for the, for experts, this, this could be a bit boring, but uh, I'm hoping that uh, in the audience, there are some people from different fields. So yeah, let me try to explain from the beginning some basic aspects of these kind of things. Yeah, ASAP is an abbreviation of the was asymmetric simple exclusion process, which is a <coughs> Markov process of many particles uh, on one dimensional lattice. One can think of a higher dimensional models, but uh, in this talk, we stick to one dimensional case. So we consider infinite lattice, Z, and uh, on each lattice side, there is a particle is empty, and each particle tries to do asymmetric random walk with hopping 
weight p to the right and q to the left. But uh, there are exclusion interactions among particles. So if two particles are on neighboring sites, like here, uh, left particle cannot hop to the, the right, and right particle cannot hop to the left. So this is the ASIC. Right? This is simple. Okay, so yeah. Yeah, maybe I want to try to explain a few words in the titles. And uh, this is clearly related to probability, right? In fact, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so this kind of uh, infinite dimensional, infinite, uh, how to say, stochastic process with infinite degrees of freedom uh, have been formulated. So at, the, at the beginning, uh, the foundation, uh, formulation of these processes with infinite degrees of freedom, this was a kind of big problem. But uh, this kind of basic fundamental aspect had been solved in the night, basically in 1970s. And uh, there's a kind of standard book by Thomas Liggett in, in 1985. So yeah, if you want to understand this kind of fundamental aspect, you should you, you may refer to his book. Right? And the, of course, there are a few other textbooks and of course original papers can pass the question yeah yeah okay yeah if you have any question please you can yeah stop me at any time okay so <clears throat> yeah but uh, this model was originally introduced in biology uh, in fact to to model uh, movement of a uh, Miss, um, to model um, <laughs> messenger array or no, sorry, <laughs> some, some ribosome on messenger array net, you know, so, so messenger array, uh, ribosome reads some information on the messenger RNA and they, there, there are some exclusion type ex interaction and uh, yeah, they could make a kind of model with this ACID. But uh, it also has been attracting a lot of attention in physics. Uh, especially this is also considered as a standard, one of the standard models in non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. And at least originally I'm from this part of the, this aspect of these processes. And uh, in statistical mechanics, there are kind of two branches. One is equilibrium statistical mechanics, the, the other is non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. And for equilibrium statistical mechanics, there is a kind of standard theory. Uh, based on maximization of uh, entropy or Gibbs ensemble or canonical ensemble. And by using such principles, one can study various properties of equilibrium systems. But uh, for non equilibrium systems, there are no such uh, fundamental theory. So we are trying to make nice models which mimic the real behaviors in nature and try to study various aspects, uh, properties of such. such uh, systems, right? <clears throat> and uh, in non-equilibrium system, uh, one big pro you know, common um, property is the existence of current. For equilibrium system, basically, usually there are no such currents, but for, yeah, one big uh, <clears throat> common feature of non-equilibrium system is the existence of current. And uh, as you can see, of course, uh, for ACIP, so th there is also a current, right? When, uh, when P is, is not equal to Q. And when we talk about ACIP, we are used basically assuming that the P is not equal to Q. So for example, when P is bigger than Q, there's a kind of net current to the right. So there's a kind of uh, average constant current. And, uh, <clears throat> but we are also interested in more fine properties of this current. For example, we are considering stochastic process. So the current is also random, random, variable, so we, we are interested in distribution, fluctuations uh, of the current. And uh, <clears throat> so th there are several versions of current, but uh, in this talk, we mostly focus on the particular uh, quantity, which is the integrated current between time zero and t, maybe under between sites zero and one. So we start from particular initial condition, and uh, we count the number of particles which crossed so this this uh, this wall this bond between sides zero and one, and uh, with positive sign to, to the left and with a, with a negative sign to the left. So so this is the integrated current between time zero and t, and this is a random number. It has average and fluctuations, and we're interested in 
distribution of it, right? <clears throat> yeah, so this is an uh, aspect of ASIP from physics, in particular, statistical mechanical side. And uh, <clears throat> interestingly, so this process is kind of integrable. Uh, for those who know integrable systems well, so the basic uh, connection between this kind of process and integrable system is that, uh, uh, so there's a generator kind of infinite dimensional matrix describing time evolution of this kind of uh, Markov process. Uh, so this is a infinite dimensional matrix uh, and uh, the state space is coming from is a configuration of uh, ASIP particles. So for the case of system size L, so maybe the matrix is size two to the power L times two to the power L. Of course, uh, when we consider the system on Z, this matrix becomes infinite dimensional. So we, we, we are considering kind of formal infinite dimensional matrix, but uh, basically the state, state space may be uh, identified with the one for spin chain. So famous one is the XXT spin chain. And indeed, <clears throat> uh, with proper, with, with certain boundary conditions, uh, stochastic generator, Markov generator of the ASIP can be shown to be similarity transformation. Similarity transforms can be similarity transformed to the Hamiltonian of XXT Hamiltonian. And as a some people should know X60 Hamiltonian is one of the best known integrable system, quantum integrable system. So and if the Markov generator of ASIP is related to X60 Hamiltonian, so one should be able to use various methods of integrable, quantum integrable systems to study ASIP. So this is the basic idea, uh, basic philosophy in this integrable probability, right? <clears throat> yeah, and of course, uh, in also, uh, Australia is one of the kind of mecca to study integrable systems. And uh, so there's a famous uh, book by Baxter. And uh, yeah, I think there are still many things one can learn about ACIP by studying Baxter's book. But uh, maybe what I want to stress here is, so yeah, you may think that uh, so then it's, it's a simple story, right? <laughs> so there are some stochastic, infinite stochastic processes, which are uh, of interest from a few points of view. Uh, prob probability theory and the non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, but uh, if it, it's just a kind of similarity transformation of X60 Hamiltonian, one can simply apply various techniques and that's it, right? But uh, maybe I want to stress that uh, somehow th there is there are such aspect too. So by using techniques from integrable system, one can study various aspects of ASIP. But maybe I want to stress that uh, there are some different aspects in integrable probability. And this is exactly what I, I want to try to explain today. <clears throat> yes, yeah, th this may be also related to the development of history of this, of the, uh, of the properties of existence, but uh, th there's a kind of seminal work in the, in, the, in the field of integrable probability. So this is the work by Johansson about the special case of ACIP. This is already more than 20 years ago. Uh, in 2000, in the paper from 2000, and the preprint was already from 1999, I think. <clears throat> yeah, so TSIP is a special case of ASIP in which particles hop only in one direction, maybe P is equal to one, Q is equal to zero. So T means a totally, totally asymmetric simple exclusion process. And then the simplest case to study, a uh, simple initial condition to study is this uh, step initial condition in which uh, we, all left sides are occupied by particles and uh, all right sides are empty at time t equals zero. And then we measure the current between time zero and t. And uh, so this is the nt and uh, we are interested in distribution. Right, and uh, I will try to explain a little more later but uh, in, in the first several slides, I will try to, uh, to kind of give a summary already of the what I want to convey <coughs> uh, in this talk. So, so this is the, kind of in, 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 the first important thing. I, yeah, at this point, I do not really explain what this is, but uh, so there's a well-known nice uh, combinatorial algorithm for correspondence called robinson schenstad knuth algorithm or uh, correspondence which is a correspondence between in integer, integer valued matrix and a pair of 
uh, semi-standard Young tableau. So this is clearly related to combinatorics. And uh, yeah, if you look at some standard books in, on combinatorics, this is one of the uh, most interesting, I would say, one of the standard things to learn. Uh, an interesting yeah, observation of this Johansson's was that uh, by using this uh, combinatorial algorithm or correspondence, one can map the problem of TASIP to combinatorics of uh, Young Tableau, right? And uh, in particular, he, what he could show is that uh, the distribution of current, which you are interested in, is more or less equivalent to the fluctuation of lambda one, which is the, so, so, so this, yeah, sorry, in Shua measure. And the Shua measure is the measure uh, on the space, on the set of partitions described by lambda. I hope that uh, so th this, I don't have to explain this, right? So, so there are a number of boxes like this and uh, the, the, the number of first row, uh, sorry, the number of boxes in the first row is denoted by lambda one and lambda two and so on. Uh, anyway, so, so this is the measure for, on the set of uh, partitions <coughs> and uh, the lambda one is the length of the first row. And then, yeah, this can be thought of as a measure on partition, the set of partitions and as uh, so lambda one is then the lambda variable. Uh, what Johansson showed is that basically <coughs> current distribution of the current is equivalent to the distribution of lambda one in the Shure measure. And the so this, in the Shure measure, we see two S lambda and S lambda is the usual Shure function, which I hope uh, you know. Shure function. And the Z is the normalization constant. <coughs> And as you may know, as this trio function has a nice formula in the form of a single determinant, H, something like this. So then, so this trio measure is a measure of the form determinant, to, uh, determinant times determinant, right? So this is a very, nice uh, form of measure. So once you have this type of measure, then <clears throat> one can show that all correlation functions are written as determinant with the same kernel, which is also called the correlation kernel. And this is also related to free fermion at still temperature. So in this way, once, once you use See this connection, then the remaining part is kind of standard, applying <coughs> free theory or determinant the theory of determinant measure, which is also very much related to random matrix theory. Then uh, one can study various properties of ACEP, uh, sorry, TASEP in this case, right? And in particular, uh, Johansson could also see what happens in the large time limit when t goes to infinity. And what he could, he could show is that uh, after some rescaling in this way, uh, the distribution of the current tends to the function uh, denoted by F2 of S, which is usually referred to as GUE trace window distribution, even though the formula around here was written uh, first by Peter Forrester here. And uh, there are a few related works. <laughs> Anyway, so this is one thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so this is a uh, kind of beginning of this integral probability. And uh, since then, there have been a lot of, lot of uh, generalizations and developments. And uh, I'm going to talk about one of, yeah, maybe a few of them. <clears throat> and at this point, let me mention a small remark. Uh, yeah, so, so we have been talking about uh, ASAP or TASAP, which is a kind of particle hopping model in, uh, of a kind of transport problem in physics language, right? But uh, so there's a simple uh, mapping from particle hopping model to surface cross model by simply replacing <coughs> empty site by upward slope and uh, occupied site by downward slope. Then particle hopping of uh, ASAP or TASAP becomes a surface configuration. 
and the hop particle hopping to the right becomes the surface growth in upward direction. And uh, yeah, so the, and the current corresponds to the height of this surface. So considering current fluctuation for TSIP or ASIP corresponds to considering uh, height fluctuation in surface growth model. And on this uh, subject of surface growth, there is a kind of st another standard model called the Carter Parit sign equation or KPC. Originally introduced by these three people in 1986. And uh, as you may notice, the Parigi is one of the no Nobel Prize winner last year. Right? <clears throat> yeah, he, yeah he, he was he had been working on spin graph theory and its applications to various things. And um, yeah, it's a little bit related to also this KPZ. Anyway, <clears throat> so in this surface growth, program, we introduce height function denoted by h at the position x and time t. And for the KPD equation, x and t are supposed to be real values, and the equation looks like this. So this is time derivative, there's a diffusive uh, smoothening, and there's nonlinearity coming from the direction of the growth, and there's also, we also have a, a random effects. So eta is taken to be Gaussian white noise. And uh, from mathematical point of view, so, so there's an issue of uh, well-definedness of this equation. So yeah, one can write down this equation rather physically and naturally, but uh, in fact, from mathematical point of view, so this is not really uh, well-defined. So one has to make sense of this. And uh, there, there was one way of doing it by using this yeah, Kohlhoff transformation, which I mentioned in a minute. But uh, kind of more general uh, way to define this kind of nonlinear partial differential equation was kind of invented first for the case of KP's equation and uh, then for more generic uh, class of uh, nonlinear PDE, uh, partial P, uh, stochastic PDEs by Martin Heider. And of course, there are also related works, works using uh, different approaches. Anyway, now, so there's a way to make sense of the KP's equation with some extra terms, but uh, yeah, in this talk, I, we are not caring so much about this. Okay, and uh, one useful thing to do for this KP's equation is to apply this nonlinear transformation, simple nonlinear transformation called called Hoff transformation. So instead of a height half function itself, we call the exponential of height function, which is denoted by Z, and uh, yeah, if you rewrite the KP's equation for the new variable z, so it, it is, it's written in this way. And this is called sometimes a stochastic heat equation. So because of this is heat equation and with stochasticity. What well, big advantage of this equation compared to the, the original KPZ equation is that, uh, so this is linear in the variable z, right? But a little problem of, about this uh, this uh, rewriting is that uh, now we have eta as a multiplicative noise, which is considered to be a bit more difficult than the additive noise. But anyway, so so, so this is often useful. And uh, one nice thing about this way of uh, rewriting is that uh, this has a, a different physical interpretation. So as you see, this is more or less the Schrodinger equation for a single particle in potential eta, but uh, with imaginary time. If you put i, so this is really Schrodinger equation, but we don't have this i, so this means that uh, we are considering imaginary time for Schrodinger equation. Uh, in other words, we are considering statistical mechanics of, of uh, some, some one particle in random potential eta. And the z can be considered as a partition function for this uh, polymer uh, in random potential eta. So this, this is the, a little bit of connection to spin graph theory. In spin graph theory, we consider random coupling constants for Ising model. But so in, in this problem, we are considering some polymer problem in random potential. And the one can apply a little bit similar techniques like uh, replica methods. But uh, we, maybe I, I don't think uh, we talk about it today. <clears throat> anyway, and uh, so this KP equation has been considered to be difficult to solve because of this nonlinearity and so on. But uh, about, about 10, uh, 12 years ago from now, uh, 
who kind of some kind of exact solution have been found by myself and the Spong and uh, at the same time by Amir Corbin Crosstail. So, okay. Let's consider a particular initial condition where z of z is equal to delta function of t equals zero, which corresponds to kind of which initial condition for the KP equation. Then for this particular case, if we consider this particular expectation value, this is expectation value, you know, so this is a solution to the stochastic heat equation with this initial condition, which is the random variable. So, and then we consider exponential of it with extra coefficients. Then we take the average expectation value. Then this particular quantity can be written as a single determinant with this particular kernel. So this was found 12 years ago. And the original derivation of this formula was taking some limit from discrete models, uh, ASAP, in, in fact. But um, yeah, so the, the, oh, soon enough, soon, almost at the same time, there were uh, works by different groups by uh, on this polymer, from the point of a polymer program, and they, you, they could arrive at the same formula uh, in a different were using this replica and the beta ansatz. So here you see that uh, basically, so the KPZ, so this kind of type of models has some strong connection to in integrable systems and one can apply kind of standard techniques of integrable systems. Yeah, so KPZ equation can be also studied using beta ansatz. Uh, but uh, so the, for the KPZ equation, there's some problem of the divergent uh, of uh, moments when you uh, take uh, some generating function. But uh, after, so this work of 2010, there are many, many works generalizing this kind of problem, uh, uh, results to the case with uh, other initial conditions and uh, some discrete models and so on. Yeah, and, uh, and as, as, as written, so there are many, many generalization of this type of results to discrete KPs models, including ACEP. And uh, what people have, in particular, so this people, in Corbin, uh, so they found that, that uh, there's a connection between these type of discrete models to a generalization of the Schur measure, which is the McDonald measure, which it may be written this way. So P lambda and the Q lambda are McDonald polynomials of functions. And Z is again, but normalization, but uh, I, I, I use Z for kind of uh, normalizations in a general, in a general sense, so yeah, this does this is of, of course completely different from that z for shear function. Anyway, so p and q are Macron measure and uh, the Macron functions, and uh, this may be thought of as again a measure on the space of in the space of uh, partitions. And as you as 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 is well known, the Macron functions or you know, polynomials goes to shear functions for a particular case. Of parameters contained in McDonald function, so so this can be considered as a generalization of the McDonald uh, Schur measure. But the big difference is that uh, for p lambda and the q lambda, if there is a formula like this, as in the case of Schur function, maybe uh, that story was quite simple. So so if this is this was this were true, then we should have a formula uh, measure in this form. Then we, we, we are in the same situation as for the sure measure, so we should be able to use the standard techniques of random matrix theory or determinant point process, so free fermion of zero temperature, and that's it. But uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, uh, so this type of formula is not known yet. But uh, this McDonald function is well known, is known to be a very, very good polynomials, multivariate also one of polynomials. So, so various nice properties are known. So people try to use nice, such nice properties of McDonald function to get some uh, results for KPZ models. And this has been quite successful. And the basic idea is the generalization of this uh, method, which has used to study KPZ equation. First, uh, consider the moments and then use the beta ansatz. And once one interesting thing which was observed from the beginning of this uh, 
formula for the KP's equation was that uh, so this, if you look at this kernel, this looks like uh, has like to have a quite nice uh, interpretation. Namely, if you focus on this part, maybe so this is nothing but a Fermi Dirac distribution factor, and uh, so, th th so this factor appears. Uh, in, a, in statistical mechanics, quantum statistical mechanics, and so this is supposed to be well related to finite temperature case of a multi-particle system of fermions. So yeah, so this formula for KPC uh, su suggested a close connection to free fermion at finite temperature from the beginning. But uh, so this in general uh, approach which was used by many people, they do not see the, the kind of real uh, direct connection from this type of models to free fermion. But rather recently, last, uh, last year, we found one way to see the more direct connection between uh, yeah, K KPZ models with discrete, uh, with discreteness or McDonald measure or the, its particular case, the Q-Hoytaka measure, and the free fermion at final temperature. So this is something I would like to explain today. Okay, ah, okay. So for free fermion, uh, yeah, for those who are not so familiar with free fermion, so this is a short summary. So free fermion is a quantum many particle system. And uh, maybe for one particle case, we can consider some eigenstate denoted by phi n and uh, with energy epsilon n. So then we, if we consider many particle case, then for the case of so-called fermions, so it is prescribed that uh, no two particles can cannot occupy the same energy level. So then, so they have to come to the different uh, states. And for the case of uh, zero temperature, so then if we, if we have n fermion particles, uh, the so-called ground state with the minimal, minimal energy should be realized and that this is this, this is realized as occupying the n levels with the lowest energy right the n lowest energies and uh, so this and this can be the kind of wave function corresponding to this ground state is described by this single determinant and then according to standard interpretation of quantum mechanics uh, we the probability density related to the existence of n particles at these positions is given by so this form. So, so this determinant squared, partition, uh, sorry, uh, wave function squared. And these are again a kind of generic normalization. So this is the probability density associated with cell temperature free fermion. And uh, once we have this form of measure, so then we can apply the standard techniques of uh, uh, free females. This is what I was mentioning for the case of taste and so on. So yeah, now you see that uh, the taste step, once the taste step is associated with this sure measure because of this formula, yeah, so taste step can be said to be related to free females at their temperature. Okay. And uh, in this case, the correlation, the all correlation functions are written in, in the form of a determinant, usually determinants, and the uh, matrix elements are given by the correlation kernel, which may can be written in this way in terms of this one particle set wave function. One can consider the finite temperature version of this situation where <coughs> we should consider infinite number of particles, but uh, each energy level may be occupied with a certain probability. And uh, you can calculate this probability and uh, this is, is actually given by this Fermi Dirac factor. Where beta is the so-called inverse temperature and the KB is just some constant known as the Boltzmann constant. And uh, this is still free fermion, even though this is a, now at a now final temperature. <coughs> and the correlation, uh, the all correlation functions are written again in the form of usual determinants and the matrix elements are given by the uh, explicit kernel. This is again called the correlation kernel and this is also written explicitly in this way in terms of the 
a one particle wave function and uh, this fame Dirac factor. And uh, yeah, so now you see that uh, once you are given this, once you see this kernel, this should be associated with the free fermion at final temperature, right? So we basically this formula and this formula. So this formula is a particular case of this one. But uh, yeah, how we can see this connection was was not achieved until last year somehow. Of course, the, yeah, there are a little bit uh, related works, but uh, the kind of direct connection has not been really understood. Okay. Okay. okay, so now, yeah, I say that the, now we found a connection by generalization of RSK. So to explain a little bit more precisely this result, so maybe it is useful to consider Cauchy identities for <coughs> uh, a few functions. So we are already talking about the Schur function and uh, yeah. So it is well known that if you, if one takes a sum of a partitions of this product of shear function, so there's a nicer product formula written on the right-hand side. And this is called the Cauchy identity for the shear function. And in fact, also, yeah, you, you can see that, the, so this is the C for the case of shear, right? Anyway, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, for example, so this, there are still many ways to prove this Cauchy identity for the Schur function, but one way is to use this RSK correspondence. So there's a, a kind of combinatorial proof of this identity for the Schur case. And uh, well, so there's uh, also a nice generalization of this Cauchy identity for the McDonald polynomials, but uh, for our purpose, uh, let's restrict us, our attention to the case of Q-Hoytaka function which is also still denoted by P and Q. And for this particular case, so the Cauchy identity is written in this way. So I hope that uh, this notation is okay, but uh, so this is a uh, infinite product, Q infinite product, right? And uh, of course, when Q, Q goes to zero, so this goes to this one and uh, this goes to here. Yeah. Uh, q function goes to Schur function and uh, this reduces to the Schur case. But uh, for the case of Schur q, uh, q function, uh, the, the proof is known, written in the book by McDonald, for example, by using kind of recursive uh, <coughs> nature of the, of the formula, but uh, the combinatorial formula uh, proof had not been known. Uh, there's also, uh, Different generalization of the of the shear function, or so and this Cauchy identity for the shear function, for the case of skew shear function, which is given here, and in this case uh, also there is a generalization of the Cauchy identity, which is written here. On the right hand side we see this, and as you notice, of course, uh, so this part and this part are just the same with some extra simple factor. So the right-hand side was, was is just, uh, they are equivalent, right? They're the same. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, in fact, what we could find last year was that uh, <clears throat> we can kind of understand why they are the same. And uh, we can refine this uh, Cauchy identity for the Q-Hoytaka function and the Skewshul function. And uh, so th this is our uh, one result of us from last year, right? If we define this function B in this way, so this is basically writing of this part using this little function B, then yeah, so if you take the, take the sum all, all over the partitions, then we get a simple, Cauchy identities, but maybe we can put some restriction on the on the length of the first rows for for both sides of the Q-Hoytaka uh, function and the Skewshur function. So then there's there's still nice uh, identity for both hand sides, and so this is uh, the, the, the formula we could prove. 
Yeah, and uh, this is related to this uh, the KPZ models and uh, we could study various properties. I think uh, I was too slow, but uh, let me try to explain a little more details about what you could do. Okay. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> yeah, in the end, uh, the, the, the still the basic uh, is the tacit. Once you understand the task, then you can think about uh, what kind of generalization would be possible or interesting. So, so this is a kind of uh, review of the work by Johansson. So the he, so in a, in a sense, the kind of continuous time ASAP is kind of standard, but uh, he considers a discrete analog of the TASEP in which particles hop to the right, right neighboring side with the probability at each time step, which is now discrete. And with the probability one minus r, and then yeah, so we still consider the step initial condition, and then so if we start from the initial condition, uh, so this is uh, this is uh, space and this is time, so you can draw some trajectories of the first few particles starting from zero minus one, one. then you see can see this kind of figure, so then. Yeah, rather than looking at the particle configuration at a given time, maybe one can think of a waiting times of each particles before making the real hop. So for example, so that this second particle cannot hop, of course, because of this exclusion here and here, but uh, at this point, he could, he could hop to the right neighboring side, but he didn't. But after waiting one time step, uh, he moved to the right hand side, right? So, so this in this case we say that uh, so this waiting time is one, and uh, in this way we, you can think of uh, <clears throat> all waiting times of uh, maybe i hop of the jth particle, right? And uh, so then you can put these numbers maybe on the on the lattice quadrant. So then, yeah, I have to skip many things. So, so in this way, you, you, you can see uh, inf no, integer valued matrix, which is uh, describing TASIP dynamics. And now you can apply this uh, RSK correspondence or algorithm to see what kind of uh, young semi-standard young tableau you may get. And in this particular exa example, which is given here, you can do this, apply this RSK algorithm and see that uh, these tables are given in this way. And uh, the information of the current is encoded in the length of the <coughs> first row of this tableau. And then, yeah, you can now map the problem TASEP to the statistics of this young tableau, right? And uh, so we are having only one parameter R it is hopping, but uh, if we generalize the model, uh, or in such a way that the waiting time of the i hop of Js particle is distributed at geometric distribution with parameter ai and pj, then you can introduce two sets of parameters ai and pj. Then we can we, have, we may be thinking that we are still considering TASEP with generalized hopping rate. Right. And uh, still, so, so this RSK correspondence still works. So then we are still considering combinatorics of uh, skew young tableau. And uh, so then if we stick to the probability of the current for TASE, then you can see that uh, <clears throat> we get some kind of partial sums of uh, semi-standard uh, semi young tableau which with some, uh, some some coefficients like AI to something, BI, BJ to something. So then by using the combinatorial formula of sure function in this form, then we see that the current distribution of the current for TASIP may be written in this form. And uh, you see that uh, this is the sure measure which I mentioned in the introduction. And the, so the considering this distribution is put is equivalent to putting the restriction for the length of the first row. So in this way, so that uh, one sees the connection between TASIP and the Shure measure. 
And uh, yeah, once you arrive at this point, then as I explained, this is rated to zero temperature, free fermion, and then <coughs> uh, you can apply the, the standard techniques to study, yeah, the distribution of the current. Okay, and then uh, for more generalized models like ASIP, uh, there are many, many KPZ models, as I mentioned. Qt ASIP, which has generalized hopping rate to the right side, or so there have been many models have been inve invented after uh, 2010, but uh, basically all models have been found to be a kind of special case or limiting case of the sto sort of stochastic highest being six vertex model. But for all of these models, basically one can apply the same techniques as I mentioned. So basically you can study uh, moments and uh, apply the beta and that's or some properties of McDonald functions. And then you can write, if you consider generative function, after long, long calculation, one can arrive as a freedom determinate formula. And uh, yeah, yeah. anyway, so here in this slide, what I want to say is that uh, there is a relation between uh, KPZ models, various KPZ models, uh, and uh, the Taka measure. And uh, <clears throat> basically the distribution of the current of the KPZ model is equivalent to the distribution of the, the length of the first row in this uh, <clears throat> measure. And the, yeah, it, this, this is what I was saying. So by the standard method, I mean, basically apply the beta and, to, and do some various uh, to long calculation to arrive at the freedom determinant formula. And uh, we found that slightly, a little bit different approach to study the same models using flow bearing determinant approach. And uh, the difference between the kind of the usual approach was that uh, in this in this formula, we see the, the Fermi Dirac factor explicitly. So then at that point, we thought that uh, probably there's a more direct connection between Q, uh, KPZ models and uh, uh, free Fermi at finite temperature. And then, yeah, there was a nice matrix forward program in 2017, I guess. And uh, then at the time we discussed, luckily uh, we could dis discuss with these people, Petri and Butia, who are studying uh, another generalization of the Schur measure, which is here periodic Schur measure. So this is written in terms of the skew Schur function with some extra weight. And uh, so, so this was originally introduced by Borodin long time ago, but uh, these people are studying this, the same measure using the language of free fermion. So it was, yeah, at that point it was it was known that uh, so this periodic sure measure is well associated with free fermion at finite temperature. Yeah, after a little modification of the measure called shift mixing. But anyway, so for, the, for this slightly modified version of the periodic sure measure, so there's uh, one can apply the standard techniques of free fermion at finite temperature. And then the distribution function of the, <clears throat> maybe the first, first row, the length of the first row of this periodic shear measure is again written as a freedom determinant. And then we notice that, uh, yeah, our kernel and their kernels are not completely the same, but are more closely related. And then we could find that indeed uh, by applying some complex analysis of arguments, we could see that uh, so they are more or less equivalent. So then, yes, yeah, so this is the result of the relation between q hoitaka measure and the periodic shear measures. I think this is still quite uh, interesting because a q hoitaka measure can be studied by basically using beta answers, which is the kind of the methods which we use usually for non-free fermion models, right? But on the right hand side, we have periodic shear measure, which is manifestly related to free frame at finite temperature. And somehow they are connected by this identity, right? And uh, we know, yeah, so we can rewrite this uh, identity in terms of expectation and the probability in, in, in the formula you, in terms of the special functions, q function and the special function. And um, yeah, we wanted to find the combinatorial. Uh, <coughs> Proof of this identity. This is what we could do. Yeah, I think I, I've tried to finish in a few minutes. 
Yeah, so we decided to, so this was really trial and, and error. So we decided to start from this side because uh, for this part, uh, there was a well, there's a well-known formula, combinatorial formula for the sculpture function. So this is just a generalization of the well-known combinatorial formula for the sculpture function. Instead of the sum of a <coughs> semi-standard tableau of shape lambda, we should use, simply use a semi-standard uh, semi tableau with a sh skew shape in this way. So then this is the sculpture function, and we start from this side. So then we consider a pair of a skew tableau like this. So then yeah, we wanted to find some combinatorial uh, object, which is related to Kyuhoitaka function, starting from this one. And the first we do a simple kind of squeezing procedure, which kills some part of the empty sites. Then we get some partition, which is denoted by new. Then we notice that uh, maybe using uh, kind of generalization of the RSK algorithm, which was already introduced long time ago by Saga and Stanley. And this is, so they use this uh, to, yeah, uh, they, they introduced this and called some uh, skewed RSK map. Then, yeah, so this is a, rather a simple generalization of the usual RSK, but uh, one new aspect is that there is uh, some, something called internal insertion. In the usual RSK, so some boxes are inserted from somewhere, but in this uh, generalization, so there's a mechanism called internal insertion in, in which we look at some number in the skew tableau, and uh, we just uh, put it to the next row. Then they apply the usual insertion algorithm and bumping and so on. So then we can arrive at that at a different skew tableau. Uh, we also introduce uh, <coughs> the kind of new operation for the pair of the skew tableau called the Yoda 2. But I'm afraid that I don't have much time to explain the details. But uh, anyway, so we by introducing a little bit new um, algorithm or operations maps to the pair of skew tableau, we could define uh, SQRSK map, and we could also apply this SQRSK maps iteratively. So then we can consider the dynamics of the pair of skew tableau. Then after applying this uh, many, many times, we see particularly interesting behavior in which we see that uh, after some long time, all columns in this uh, skew tableau are kind of separated and they do an kind of independent uh, free emotions, right? And then we may focus on these uh, particular field boxes. So then we can consider a pair of some combinatorial, some kind of tableau, which are different from the usual scan standard tableau because we are not putting some co conditions among the columns. But still, so in each, in each column, they are increasing, but uh, there are no conditions on the, among the columns. And then this is something we are calling this. This is not so, this, there are a few works, but uh, this is not so standard one, but uh, <coughs> uh, tableau, but uh, in this, in our work, this plays an important role and we are calling this a vertically strict tableau, VST. And um, yeah. Then, so we, uh, it took some time to realize, but that after some time we noticed that, that this object is indeed related to the combinatorial formula for the Kyuhoitak function, which is given here. Yeah, so, so the language was a slightly, a little bit different in a few papers, but uh, yeah, in our language, if you take a sum of a VST with some coefficients with what is called energy function depending on VST, so then this gives the Kyuhoitak function. Yeah, so this is the basic idea. Then, yeah. So, so then I think now you can see the basic idea. Yeah, we start from, we wanted to prove this identity. We started from combinatorial formula for this. And after, after applying this QRSK dynamics, we found some two, two tableau related to, to these two things. Of course, we still have to explain this and this, but unfortunately today I don't have enough time to explain. 
But anyways, yeah, we could find a nice bijection between pair of skew tableau and uh, this VST with extra information. And uh, we could prove that formula, right? Okay, yeah, and uh, to, to give a real proof, uh, this we can, uh, this uh, original kind of definition using RSK type algorithm, this is not very useful, but uh, after a while we noticed that by kind of generalizing this kind of theory of affine crystal, then one can, we, we can study the SQRSK dynamics and prove a theorem. theorem. Okay, so and uh, this gives us a kind of new, new approach to study KPZ models. And uh, yeah, as I was saying, so kind of standard approach was to use beta ansatz and just a lot of lengthy calculations. But uh, and our our case is also a little bit lengthy in the sense that uh, first we have to think about uh, some new ideas. But once we have this connection, the, the, the remaining is quite a clear, uh, simple, at least conceptually. Once we have the connection to periodic sure, so this is uh, associated with the free fermion at final temperature, then we can simply apply the usual machinery of a free fermion or determinant point process at final temperature. And uh, this can be applied to the half space case. And uh, so the, for the half space case, uh, we get the free fermion formula. And somehow, so this uh, half space case had to be considered to be difficult for KPZ, KPZ models. So this is one nice application of a new approach. Okay, sorry. So, so this is the, the, the final slide. So first, uh, yeah, for those who are not, not familiar with this subject, the, the, the kind of basic message I wanted to convey here is that the, the integral probability is a relatively new field to study interacting stochastic models with integrability, but uh, this is not simply a kind of application of the known techniques of integral systems to stochastic processes, but uh, there are some uh, different and new ideas or insights which are required. And this gives us uh, some new, interesting new aspects, new developments. And uh, in, today I talked about our new SQLSK and the application to KPZ. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you very much for your so letting your applaud on behalf of everyone. Um, okay, so time for questions. If you have a question, uh, raise your Zoom hand or ask a question in Q&A, we can allow you to, uh, to talk. Yeah, so maybe I can start yeah, with um, the comment you made on the previous slide, because I think mm -hmm. earlier it was maybe felt that some of the free fermion properties had to do with the specific observable that you're looking at mm -hmm. and not necessarily with the whole model. You're looking at an interacting model uh, yeah, yeah. that has free fermion properties. But are you saying that the free fermion is really a, 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 the heart and soul of, of the model that you're looking at, even if it's interacting? Or is it the particular observable that you're looking at just picks out free <laughs> fermion properties? Mm, mm, that's a good point. Um, it's still not completely clear. As you may know, for the case of Q equals zero, so for the case of Johansson, of course, a uh, free fermion has much uh, and deeper consequences to the properties of TASIP. For, for example, one can study. Uh, joint distribution of the heights or position currents and so on, but this is still not possible for the general Q. But uh, and uh, what we have, for the moment, uh, what we could do is just to show the equivalence of two observables for just single quantity. This is true, but uh, at least uh, so this. Let's see. So in, in this Kyohitaka measure, no, it's not so easy to do. But it's the particular yeah. quantity that, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, we, we can talk about it uh, some more uh, soon <laughs> at Matrix. That's right. Um, are there any, any other yeah. questions? <laughs> I've got, I have one more, which is related mm -hmm. to the half space. So you say you can mm -hmm. apply this to the half space. Can you apply it to the half space where you have particle injection and extraction? So 
at the at the <laughs> uh, has I mean, ha, you, 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 the case with both boundaries, right? On the finite lattice. Uh, no, 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 no. One, okay. one, one boundary, one. one boundary, but with the particles hopping in and out. For the moment, uh, we can put only one parameter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is still yeah restricted. Yeah. Okay. So I think Peter Forrest has a comment or question. Peter, if you, you can unmute yourself. Oh, yeah, Peter's now uh, left. Oh, okay. Um, okay, I'm just looking at the at the list of attendees. Well, if no one has a, a question, then I'd like to. Thank Tomo here again for a very interesting talk and uh, hope to see you all again soon at the next Matrix seminar. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you very much.